way. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Payman. We'll now move to question time. Senator McGrath. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Can the Minister name anywhere in Australia where power prices have been reduced since you've been in government? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam President, and thank Senator McGrath for his, um, his, um, his, uh, his question. Um, um, <clears throat> look, I have to say I, um, I'm, uh, I, I don't follow um, power prices as closely to be able to answer the the question, and I'm not sure that there's any any uh, any person in this chamber who is um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, closely watches uh, power prices to be able to give uh, uh, that answer. But what I can say what I can say is this, um, Senator McGrath, and <clears throat> um, I did say something uh, similar yesterday that. Um, it's the objective of the Albanese government to put downward pressure on power prices um, so that um, Australian consumers, household, uh, householders, but also Australian businesses um, don't have to pay the high electricity prices that have resulted from your years and years and years of neglect uh, in this uh, space. Um, we want Australian consumers, we want Australian businesses um, to um, be paying less for their power prices. And so the things that we've done, the caps that we've done, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to get, well firstly it wasn't easy to make that decision. It wasn't easy um, to get it through this parliament because your party, your party opposed all of those uh, changes that might have put downward pressure on electricity prices. So I think, I think it's a little bit rich, you coming into this question time asking these questions when we're in a situation as a result of your neglect. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Your time uh, for answering that question has expired. Senator McGrath, first supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister identify a single mortgage holder who has seen their interest rate go down in the past 10 months? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President. Se thank you, uh, President, and um, uh, thank Senator McGrath for um, uh, for his uh, for his question. Um, look, I have great sympathy for uh, mortgage holders for the situation in which uh, they find themselves and the repeated increases in uh, in interest rates. But um, there's a whole uh, Sen ra Minister, um, please. Uh, Resume your seat. As Senator thought I was going to bring it to the chamber's attention, I was just going to let this set of questions go. King photos. Um, that's yes. all. Thank you. I remind all there apparently is a senator taking photos. We all know that's inappropriate. I just remind the chamber to um, to not do that. And um, I expect I expect. Senator Thorpe, I am responding. I expect the government will um, speak to the senator concerned. Minister Farrell, please concern. Please continue. All right. Um, so where was I? Um, okay. Okay. So so um, we all know we all know the reasons why there's pressure on um, interest uh, rates in in this country and. Um, we're not unique in that regard because there's uh, pressure on, on re uh, uh, interest rates going up uh, right, right around the world. But again, this government is trying to do things to reduce um, cost of living. Um, um, well, uh, thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator McGrath, second supplementary. Can the minister identify a single person whose grocery bill is lower today? Than when you came into government. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator McGrath for his uh, question. Well, again, um, I, I can't say that I know um, the grocery price of you know every retail uh, store in the uh, in the country, and therefore you know what uh, the consumers themselves choose to uh, to buy. I do know I do know that uh, as a matter of practice, having 
uh, some experience in the retail industry and a former, uh, former occupation that uh, one thing people do do uh, when uh, prices start to rise is they change uh, the particular products that they, uh, that, that, that they purchase. But again, um, it's the purpose, it's a purpose, it's the purpose of this it's, it's the purpose. It's the purpose of this government to try and put downward pressure on the cost of living, and we're doing that. We're doing that in terms of things like uh, childcare. We're we're uh, doing that. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Walsh. President, <clears throat> my question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Today, new homelessness data has been released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, which shows that over 122,000 people were homeless on census night. Can the minister outline the practical measures the Albanese Labor government is taking to address cost of living pressures for people, particularly those experiencing housing stress or homelessness? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Minister Gallagher. Thank you very much, President. I thank Senator Walsh uh, for her question. The Albanese government wants every Australian to have the security of having a roof over their head. We know that too many Australians are being hit by growing rents and too many Australians are struggling to buy a home. It's unacceptable that it's getting more and more expensive to have a safe and secure home. And sadly, as we've found out today, as Senator Walsh alluded to in her question, far too many Australians are facing homelessness. As reported today on census night, nearly 123,000 Australians were homeless. This is unacceptable. We have also seen figures today that show in the five years to 2021, under the former government's watch, the number of homeless people grew each night by 6,000. This is what we need to improve. This is why we need to improve access to affordable and safe homes for all Australians. We were elected with a plan to clean up the mess that was left behind and help tackle the cost of accessing a home. Fundamental to our plan is increasing the supply of new housing. Australians do not have enough supply of new housing. The $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund will be the largest boost to social and affordable homes in a decade. The 30,000 homes the fund will deliver are one part of the Albanese government's ambitious housing agenda, which also includes broadening the National Housing Infrastructure Facility, the Housing Accord, the $1.6 billion National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, the Interim National Housing Supply and Affordability Council, a new National Housing and Homelessness Plan, the Help to Buy Scheme and the Regional First Home Buyer Guarantee. Uh, the government is going to continue to push and argue in this chamber uh, to have the passage of that important piece of legislation so that we can put in place the fund that will provide an ongoing source of investment into the social and affordable housing sector. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, how will the Albanese Labor government's Housing Australia Future Fund help to support people with acute housing needs? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Walsh. The Housing Australia Future Fund will provide regular and reliable capital funds to build new social and affordable homes across Australia in perpetuity. As we've heard in the Senate hearing last week from experts, community housing providers, homelessness services and academics, this is urgently needed. National Shelter, the peak body that so many of us deal with on these matters, called it the most critical housing legislation to be brought forward for the past 10 years. In, in its first five years, this fund will be investing in building uh, 20,000 social housing properties with 4,000 properties for women and children fleeing domestic violence and older women who are at risk of homelessness, $100 million for crisis and transitional housing for women and children, and $30 million to build more housing for veterans who are experiencing or at risk of, of homelessness. I hope that everyone in the Senate will consider these statistics when that legislation comes for a vote over this sitting Minister, fortnight. Minister, Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Minister, why is it so important that the Housing Australia Future Fund is delivered? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. And I thank Senator Walsh for the question and for her interest in um, the issue of social and affordable housing in Australia. It's so important that this fund is delivered. It is the first fund of its kind which would provide an ongoing revenue stream into the social and affordable housing sector. 
the first time that we would have set something up via legislation to make investments. And this is over and above the traditional areas of the Commonwealth investment through our national partnerships with the states and territories, but it's in recognition that um, there is not enough supply and there is not enough supply of housing going into the areas where it's needed the most, in First Nations communities, in, um, for women, for veterans, um, for especially single older women who um, have no retirement savings or, and who might be living on their own. Um, this is the area that we need to make these investments, and that is why this piece of legislation is so important, and that is why the opposition should change their position Thank you, on Minister. this bill. Senator Chandler. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Yesterday during question time, the Minister for Finance said, the fact is stage three tax cuts have been legislated by this chamber. They are in place. Stage three will commence in July next year. The policy we took to the election was that those tax cuts remain and our position has not changed. That is what I was saying yesterday. That continues to be our position. Minister, does Mr Albanese, the Prime Minister, remain committed to implementing the stage three tax cuts? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister Farrell. <coughs> Thanks. Um, I thought the answer was yes, John. You could just say yes. Order. Don't get to As much. Thank you, anymore, President, right? and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Chandler. And um, I, um, with all due respect to Senator Birmingham, I am quite capable of answering my own questions and doesn't don't need his um, don't 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 need Order. don't need Order. don't. And Minister Farrell, don't, please don't resume need, your seat, uh, Minister. Minister Farrell, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Thank you. Order on my left. Minister Farrell. Thank you, thank you, President. Thank you for that uh, protection. Um, um, look, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I find it. I find it difficult to understand why the coalition. This is the second question today. Um, that, that, that you've asked, uh, basically asking the same question that you answered yesterday, and would would you be surprised? Would you be surprised, Senator? Senator would would you be surprised, Senator Chandler, if the Prime Minister, um, who's doing a wonderful job, had any different had, he, had any different view about tax cuts than uh, the Finance Minister, who's doing just a, an amazing job, given. The, uh, the mess that uh, you left her uh, to, uh, to yes, yes, I'd forgotten about that. Yes, yes. At least we have a finance minister who is trusted by uh, his. Uh, well, Senator they Cash. trust him too. They they trust him too. They trust him too, Senator Cash. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Cash, you've got. A minister on her, uh, a senator on her feet, Senator Chandler. Thank you, President. The point of order was relevance. It was a very specific question, and the minister has been going for 93 seconds now. It does require just a one-word answer, if you could provide it. Um, the minister is being the minister is being relevant. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Please continue, Minister Farrell. Yes, yes, yes. Well, can I say to Senator? Thank you, President. Can I say to Senator Chandler? Um, if, you want to, if you want to answer my questions, then there's no point um, you asking the questions to me. You might as well answer them yourself. But, um, but, 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 order. But, 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 but look, look, um, look. Um, you've asked the same question to me that you asked to uh, Senator uh, Senator Gallagher Thank yesterday. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Chandler, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, yesterday in question time, the Minister for Finance also said our position on tax cuts hasn't changed, but we are in the position of having to repair a budget. Can the Prime Minister guarantee that his government's policy Order. in relation to stage three tax cuts will not change in the future? Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Chandler, for your first supplementary question. Well, again, the, um, you've, got, you, you've got the answer because the finance minister, who's in charge of uh, this uh, area, um, answered that question. Answered the question um, yesterday. But look, can I try and put? Can I expand? You've, you've referred to 
um, the issues that uh, um, Senator Gallagher raised yesterday. Can I expand um, on um, the financial mess that we discovered when we came to this country? And can I just can I just report on one 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 fact one fact that puts this into perspective? Um, when Labor lost uh, power in 2013, uh, our national debt was $300 billion. Uh, when, we came, when we came to power, when we came to power um, 12, almost 12 months ago, that figure had blown out to Thank $1 Thank you, Minister. The time dollars. for answering has expired. Senator Chandler, second supplementary. Don't get near what the was the trajectory? Thank you, President. Minister, why can't you be honest with the Australian people and admit now that you Order. won't be implementing the Stage 3 tax cuts? Order on my right, Minister Farrell. Thanks, sir. Thanks, um, thanks sir, President. And I again thank uh, Senator Chandler for her, uh, her question. Well, honesty. Honesty. Hey? We're talking about honesty. Honesty. Why didn't the former Prime Minister of this country, tell us that he replaced five ministers of the uh, former government. Five, five, maybe even six. I think we've discovered it might even be six. And you, 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 you dare to talk about honesty. Now, what, what, what Prime Minister Albanese um, says, he does. So when he said he was going to put downward pressure. On, order, on. order, Senator Farrell, order, order on my left. Your leader is on his feet. Order, Senator Birmingham. President, I'm afraid Senator Farrell is misleading Senator the chamber Birmingham. because if the Prime Minister Senator says what Birmingham. he does, where are the $275 tax cuts? Senator Birmingham, thank you. Please continue, Minister Farrell. I, I reject that point of order. <coughs> um, he didn't even get to the point of order stage, Minister. <laughs> Please continue. Um, I'm not sure why they're all so happy today. What are you happy about? Uh, uh, thank oh. you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Waters. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister. Responding to the latest IPCC synthesis report yesterday, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said no new coal oil or gas and no expansions of existing coal, oil or gas reserves. Why does Labor want to open the 116 new coal and gas projects in the pipeline? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President. And I thank, uh, 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 thank uh, Senator Waters for her, uh, her question. Um, the Australian government, of course, uh, welcomes the IP CC report, and uh, I think even 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 uh, you, Senator uh, Waters, uh, would acknowledge that there's been a significant change in terms of the issues of uh, climate change, which, of course, the IPCC uh, were dealing with uh, in their um, uh, in their report uh, between our government and the former government, um, and in particular. And in particular, the greater commitments uh, that uh, we have made as a government uh, to addressing the issues of, uh, of climate change and starting the process of increasing the speed at which our economy is uh, decarbonised. Now, that unfortunately, it's not an easy thing to do. You can't snap your fingers like that and suddenly go from a fossil fuel supported economy to a renewable economy. You just, you just can't do it. You can't do it. And I, I wish you could. I wish, I, wish, I, wish, I wish you could do that uh, in, by uh, flicking my fingers, but, but we can't do it. So, so uh, this, government, this government is moving down uh, the, the path of decarbonisation, but we're doing it in a sensible way. We're doing it in a sensible way. Firstly, <clears throat> trying to bring the community with us, and I think we, we're doing that. We, we, we brought them with us. <clears throat> or they voted for us at the last election, Senator McKim. They voted, they voted for us. They Order. voted for us. <clears throat> you don't like it. They voted for us as a government. They voted for our policies, not your policies. And they certainly didn't vote for your uh, policies. Minister Farrell, the time for answering has expired. Senator Waters, first supplementary. 
Thanks, President. The government has called for budget restraint. The UN Secretary General and the International Energy Agency have both called for cuts to public subsidies for fossil fuels, which incidentally would save your budget $11 billion every year. Will the government end fossil fuel subsidies to help tackle the economic and climate crises? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister Farrell. Thank you, um, thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, Senator uh, uh, Walters for her, uh, her question. Um, look, um, the issue of um, transition, which is what we're talking about here, transition from a fossil fuel economy uh, to a uh, renewable um, uh, economy uh, is not. It's not an easy transition. It's easy to say. It's easy to talk about. Uh, e Senator Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I specifically asked about fossil fuel subsidies and when you're going to axe the $11 billion a year you give in cheap uh, diesel and accelerated depreciation to fossil fuel companies. Thank you, Senator Waters. I'll remind Senator Farrell of the question. So, Senator Farrell. Thank, thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank, uh, thank Senator Waters for her uh, intervention there. Um, look, look. Um, if, as I was saying, if there was an easy way to solve this problem, like uh, simply uh, abolishing, uh, ab ab abolishing the sorts of uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. You can help Senator Farrell. Uh, Senator, Senator Watt has already ruled this change Senator out being Birmingham. in the budget. Senator Bur Birmingham. Please, that's not a point of order. Minister Farrell, please continue. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President. Um, look, look. Um, um, yeah, yeah, look. Um, uh, thank you, I... Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Order. Order. Uh, Senator Waters, second supplementary. Thanks, President. <coughs> well, Will the Labor Party return the $960,000 it received in donations from the fossil fuel sector just in the last financial year so that you can start Senator making Watt. policy decisions based on science? Senator Watt. Senator Watt. Uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, you, uh, th thank, you, uh, thank you, President. And, uh, uh, the short answer is uh, no. We're not going to uh, return those uh, donations any more, any more, any more than you've uh, returned donations from companies that uh, donate to the uh, to the Greens, who uh, who also have investments in uh, fossil uh, fuel. Um, and uh, I understand your your organisation has refused to uh, return those. Uh, nor nor do you return um, you know um, donations from. Companies uh, engaged in, uh, in, in in gambling. Um, so, but can I say can I say can I say this to you, Senator um, Waters? Minister Farrell, I agree. please resume your I Minister agree. Farrell, please. Senator Watt, Senator Watt, I have a senator on his feet, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, senator Shoebridge, resume your seat. Resume your seat, Senator Shoebridge. Order. If you rise to your feet during question time, it is to call a point of order, not to make a statement. You can make statements at other times in this place. Minister Farrell, please continue. Um, President, uh, obviously we touched a nerve uh, yeah. there, yeah. and uh, the Greens are embarrassed about their their donations. But can I can I say this to? the Greens and to the Coalition, uh, we do need to reform the donation regime in this country. Thank you, Minister. And the time only for one answering party. has expired. Uh, Senator Grogan. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Skills and Training, Senator Watt. Um, the Albanese government has a clear agenda to create the jobs of the future by taking advantage of the transition to renewable energy and investing in skills and training. Um, how is the government's commitment to action on climate change supporting the jobs and skills of the future? 
Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Grogan, who, of course, has a very long history in supporting all of these issues, even before she arrived in this place. Right now, this parliament is faced with a very simple choice. For the first time in a decade, we can seize the opportunity to reduce emissions from Australia's big emitters, or we can squander that opportunity yet again. Reforms to the safeguard mechanism are crucial to meeting our legislated emissions reduction target, the target that most honourable senators voted for in this place last year. When this parliament voted for a 43 per cent emissions reductions target for our country, the very senators who argued for a higher target are now the ones who would have it be even lower. Without the changes that the safeguard mechanism involves, our nation is looking at a 35 per cent emissions reductions target by 2030, 8 per cent lower than what was legislated by this parliament last year. And those honourable senators who said the target should be higher now have a choice to make, because if they vote against these reforms, they are voting for a lower outcome than what was legislated just last year. Those senators would be voting against a 43 per cent emissions reduction target and against net zero by 2050. We all have the opportunity here to take 205 million tonnes of carbon out of the air by 2030, the equivalent of two-thirds of the cars on Australia's roads. We have the chance to drive change among the 215 biggest emitters in the country, who represent 28 per cent of Australia's overall emissions. Now, yesterday's IPCC report, which has been cited in here today, showed that this decade is the critical decade for action, the critical decade to make an urgent, rapid and far-reaching transformation across our economy, and that's exactly why all senators should vote for the changes we're proposing thank for the you, safeguards Senator mechanism. Watt. Senator Grogan, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Senator Watt. That was a wise advice that you've given there. Um, given the jobs and skills of the future depend on industry and business having certainty and confidence, can the minister outline how a predictable trajectory for emissions reduction will give that certainty and confidence? Minister Watt. Thanks again, Senator Grogan. The government's safeguard mechanism reforms that all senators will have the opportunity to vote on in the next couple of weeks are the next step to ensure that Australian industry remains competitive in a decarbonising global economy while reducing their emissions. What this means for Australians is jobs, clean, green and renewable jobs of the future, jobs in green steel manufacturing, green hydrogen, offshore wind and other associated industries. If we get the policy settings right for business to decarbonise, we will achieve this ambition. And that's why the Business Council of Australia, the Australian Industry Group and the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry support these reforms, and 80 per cent of facilities are already covered by corporate net zero commitments. Interesting that the parties who say that they support big business aren't backing in those business groups on this point. Business knows that reducing emissions is essential to their long-term competitiveness in a global net zero economy, and that's why they're supporting the safeguards mechanism Thank you, Minister. Change. The time for answering has expired. Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, Senator Watt, are there any threats to delivering the skills, training and jobs of the future? Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Grogan. And unfortunately, there are a range of threats, and not always from the sources that you would expect. Uh, the truth is that Australia is starting way behind where we should, largely as a result of the Greens voting with the Liberals and Nationals against the CPRS in 2009, and I'd be pretty embarrassed about that too. And of course, it's also due to a decade of inaction from those on the other side. And now the Greens are faced with the same choice 14 years later. And I say to the Green senators, do you really want to find yourselves sitting next to Senator Rennick? Senator Antic, Senator Canavan, Senator Canson, Senator Roberts, and all of those other people who say that climate change isn't real, do you really want to be sitting next to them when this comes to a vote in the next fortnight? Uh, or will you be on the right side of history? Will you listen to the appeals of groups like the Carbon Market Institute, the Investor Group on Climate Change, the Australian Conservation Foundation and the Climate Council, who all say that this Thank whole you, Senate Senator should Watt. back the safeguard mechanism? Your time has expired. Order. I remind you, Senator Watt, to please direct your comments and answers to the Chair. Senator Roberts. My question to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher, follows calls from concerned constituents 
and relates to Labor's bank deposits guarantee element of the financial claims scheme. Minister, can you assure constituents and assure the Senate that in the event of a banking failure, every cent in every Australian's bank accounts will be guaranteed under the deposit guarantee scheme? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, I do welcome the opportunity to uh, talk to the Senate about the strength of our banking system, um, and because I think it is an important uh, issue to reassure Australians, uh, indeed, that we have a very strong, well-regulated, well-led, well-capitalised, uh, with good liquidity uh, banking system. Uh, I would also say, so I think that should provide reassurance um, to the Australian people about the system that we have in place. It's been strengthened considerably in the years since the GFC and think, since the Banking Royal Commission, uh, and it's a, obviously a, a vital uh, and important uh, sector for our, the overall functioning of our economy. I would also say that the Treasurer and the Assistant Treasurer uh, meet regularly and are getting updates regularly on the global uh, situation, the, what we've been seeing happening uh, overseas, about, and uh, including meeting with the regulators of our system uh, to get up-to-date advice. And well, oh, sorry, Minister Gallagher, Senator Roberts. I ask specifically for the minister to guarantee that to assure constituents that in the event of a banking failure, every cent in every Australian's bank accounts will be guaranteed. I'm not interested in overseas. just want uh, to know thank you, for every cent. Senator Roberts, I do believe the minister is being relevant to your question. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. And uh, thank you, President. And for um, thank you, Senator Roberts. I mean, the, I only briefly went overseas. I was giving that as additional reassurance. Um, the initial uh, part of my remarks, my answer was about the strength of the Australian banking system, where, which is where Australians have their deposits and have their money, uh, and I was providing that reassurance that Senator Roberts was seeking about the strength of the banking system uh, and uh, the fact that we are taking advice daily. In fact, the Treasurer and the Assistant Treasurer are getting briefings regularly about the situation overseas because that directly links to your question, which is uh, some of the concerns that we've seen in banks overseas. I mean, we are connected in a global world, and so we do keep an eye on that in order to keep an eye on what's happening in Australia. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Roberts, first supplementary. I note that twice the Minister has not assured people that every cent in every Australian's bank accounts will be guaranteed. So, Minister, what is the total figure for depositors' funds in Australia? And of that, what percentage does the deposit guarantee scheme actually guarantee? Minister. Uh, thank you. On that, I don't have those details um, in front of mind uh, or actually in my um, papers, so I will come back to the Senator and the Senate with an update. If I can do that during question time, I will. But I would say that when, when we have faced challenges in the banking system in Australia, which we are not facing now, um, the government, um, and I would presume this would have been on either side of the political fence, would act quickly to respond to any concerns that we saw in the banking system, which goes to your question about guaranteeing deposits. Um, so, but we are not in that situation, and that is why my an answer to your original question was about the strength of the banking system here and the fact that we are keeping close watch on what's happening internationally in case there are any impacts that come our way from it. Senator Roberts, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Since 2008, the deposit guarantee scheme has been capped at $20 billion per bank and $80 billion total. Minister, do you have $80 billion sitting there ready to go? And if not, how much is immediately accessible to the scheme and how long will it take for the full guarantee amount to be available? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, in the event um, that we needed to respond, I can guarantee uh, that the government would move quickly to uh, ensure the stability and security of Australia's banking system. But that is not the situation we are in. Um, the regulators advise us uh, that the banks are well capitalised, with good liquidity, uh, they're well led, they're profitable. Um, they are engaged with regulators all the time, 
Uh, and the government remains uh, absolutely aware to the issues overseas and engaged with all of those, uh, the banking system, the regulators and other stakeholders, to ensure that remains the case. And if there was any concerns, the government would respond quickly. Thank you, Minister. Senator Cadell. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Earlier this week, the Prime Minister said it has been a good 10-month period because what we've been doing is going through fulfilling the election commitments we made at the election. Yeah. Meanwhile, families in New South Wales, including the parents of St Phillips College up above us, are facing double digit in energy costs. Where is the commitment to the $275 energy price card that you get? Uh, Senator Farrell. Order. Order. Sarah, Sarah, I'd be Order. Order across the chamber. Or Senator Watt. Senator Gallagher, order across the chamber. Minister Farrell. I'd, I'd stop talking, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Every time you how are you now, out, please? Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Watt, I've called you several times. Interjections across the chamber are disorderly. Yeah. Minister Farrell. Thank you. Thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator um, Cadell for his uh, question and welcome all of those people up there uh, who uh, are taking an interest in uh, democracy. Um, uh, <laughs> they're not frightened of me. <laughs> even, even you're not frightened of me. <laughs> um, but getting back to the question at uh, hand, of course, um, uh, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister is deeply concerned about cost of living issues uh, that face uh, everyday, uh, everyday Australians. And um, what's he doing about it? Well, of course, he's uh, supported the uh, increase in the minimum wage uh, and a pay rise for aged care workers, made childcare cheaper in this country, pushing down the price of uh, medicine creating 180,000 uh, new fee-free fee -free, fee -free trade places to make up for all of those uh, <coughs> job shortages that uh, your policies uh, created, uh, delivering, delivering 20,000 new university, delivering 20, new university places, establishing 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave, he convened a job uh, uh, and skills summit. He established a jobs and skills Australia. In fact, the question the question you could almost ask is what is what is it that Prime Minister Albanese hasn't done to help the Australian people? He hasn't. And and I can I can I can, I can go on. I can um, go Minister on. Minister Farrell, your time has expired. Senator Cadell, first supplementary. The same parents of these children are now facing an average of 9.2 per cent price rises in staples like bread, fruit, vegetables and dairy. After just 10 months, what specific relief has the government delivered for those New South Wales families struggling to buy those basics to put on the table to feed those children? Thank you, Senator Cadell. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you President. Thank you, uh, Senator Cadell, for his, uh, his question. Well, you obviously weren't listening to my previous answer because I listed, I listed ten, ten or more things, ten or more things that the Albanese government is doing to put downward pressure on uh, uh, on the cost of living. Uh, nobody understand. With a background, with a background like his, nobody understands cost of living pressures more than our uh, than our prime minister. Yes, yeah, seriously. Yep, seriously. He understands. He understands. He understands the cost of living pressures on ordinary Australians. But what could you have done? What could you have done in this? What could you have done in these ten months that might have helped the parents of these children push down something like electricity prices? You could have voted. You could have voted. You could have voted for the cap on gas prices. Thank you, that Minister would push Farrell. The time for answering has expired. Senator Cadell, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Under your government, New South Wales families have also experienced 10 interest rate rises, meaning most families are now paying an extra 1,400 per month in uh, interest. 
No $275 energy bill cut, at least 9.2 per cent in the price of staples and 10 interest rate rises. Is that this government's idea of a good 10 months for Australia? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Goodell, for his uh, question. And it's interesting you're focusing all of your questions about New South Wales. Well, maybe that's because there's uh, an election on in uh, New South Wales is coming Saturday, and and your Minister your, Farrell, your candidates, Minister your Farrell, candidates, Minister your Farrell, candidates who Minister represent Farrell, your please resume your seat. Order on my left, Senator Cash. I had to call the minister about four times because it was so noisy in here he couldn't hear. Minister Farrell, please continue. Please continue. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the direction to come and uh, stand, in which I'm doing right now. Um, and plus, I was getting a little bit of advice from my colleagues uh, behind me. So, well, they're all. They, I can't think of everything, um, President. You know. I've, uh, I need, I need. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Hanson. I want relevance to the question because I want to hear an answer. I don't want to hear waffling on about the New Thank South you. Wales state election, Thank which has got Senator nothing Hanson. to do with the question. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Order. There are a lot of interjections across the chamber, including direct interjections to the minister. Please continue, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. Well, I'll go through them. I'll go through them. Cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines, uh, 180,000 fee-free uh, TAFE places, 20,000 new university uh, places, uh, 10 days paid family and domestic leave. We convened. We convened a jobs and skills. Thank you, uh, Minister. Summit. The time for answering has expired. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians. A recent FOI exposed a secret, dirty secret report to the National Indigenous Australians Agency that concluded traditional owners in the Beetaloo Basin won't benefit economically, socially or culturally from fracking their country. It also stated that the traditional owners are at a clear disadvantage when negotiating with gas giants. How do you justify fucking, sorry, fracking the Beetaloo after these revelations? Uh, thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. President, and I thank Senator Thorpe for the question. I understand Senator Thorpe's question relates to the report commissioned uh, by the NIAA on Beedaloo, which was done under the previous government. Um, the NIAA commissioned the blueprint for Indigenous benefits realisation, the Beedaloo region report in 2020, um, done by external consultants who prepared the report. It doesn't constitute legal advice or represent uh, the government's uh, position. Um, we absolutely acknowledge First Nations people uh, connection to country is central to their spiritual, cultural, physical and economic well-being and that native title recognises First Nations people's pre-existing land and water rights and interests. Um, we also recognise the importance of thorough consultation with First Nations people with the cultural authority to speak for country in line with the principles of free, prior and informed consent. Uh, land councils have those statutory responsibilities under law to consult with traditional owners and native title holders regarding activities on their traditional land, and we are also taking action to ensure the voices of First Nations people are heard and listened to, of course, as we are um, through the uh, voice uh, to parliament. In specifically, um, in uh, relation to the Beedaloo Basin. Um, the Northern Land Council has uh, statutory responsibilities under law to consult the traditional owners and native title holders regarding the activities on their uh, traditional land, um, and we are uh, and committed uh, to working with them. Um, and this includes um, support via the Australian government and those ongoing uh, discussions. 
Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Thorpe, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Given the clear disadvantage of traditional owners when negotiating with these gas, dirty gas giants and their almost unanimous opposition to fracking, no free prime informed consent, I beg your pardon, will you withhold any fracking in the Beedaloo until and unless genuine consent has been obtained? If you have free prime informed consent, show us. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, I think um, the issues of the Beedaloo Basin uh, really fall under the responsibilities of the Northern Territory Government um, through the arrangements uh, they have and through the responsibilities they have at, you know, via the, the Territory laws. Um, but you know, I think the Federal Government remains open to working with any community on any issue um, where there are concerns and if, those, um, in, if the standard processes that have been put in place uh, aren't working, then of course um, the government would stand ready and able and willing to engage with them on any issue that they seek to raise. Senator O'Neill. Oh, se sorry, Senator Thorpe. <laughs> Second supplementary. Thanks, President. Thanks, Minister, for your answers. So what this comes down to is whether the government stands with First Nations people or with gas, gas companies that fund your party. So whose side are you on? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, Senator Thorpe, you've asked your question. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, the Commonwealth has specific responsibilities in relation to approvals for particular projects. Um, I know this one has been controversial. Um, and I, I would just urge those that do have concerns, and if Senator Thorpe has, has uh, people that um, you know, don't feel that they are being spoken for or are able to have their voice heard, then I would encourage her to encourage them to come forward and to also, you know, the Commonwealth remains committed to be working in partnership with um, land councils, First Nations communities and the Northern Territory government uh, to sort through any of the concerns that may exist. But um, ultimately, um, you know, the Commonwealth has um, specific and set responsibilities in this area. Thank you, Minister. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry and Science, Senator Farrell. What are the government's plans to build a strong and growing manufacturing industry in Australia? Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. And I thank uh, Senator O'Neill for her very uh, deep interest in this area and, uh, of course, her interest in ensuring uh, a, uh, a new Labor government in New South Wales uh, this coming weekend. Um, Australia uh, must be a country that uh, makes things, uh, uh, President. Uh, the $115 billion National Reconstruction Fund is a key platform to support, diversify and transform Australian industry. The NRF will target projects and investments that help Australia capture new, high-value uh, market opportunities. This will help our businesses grow and succeed, both in the economy of today and of tomorrow. The uh, NRF will provide finance to grow advanced manufacturing and support uh, businesses to innovate and to move up the technological ladder. But it also supports our national sovereign capability. In the early days of the pandemic, people were shocked that Australia couldn't make enough masks or PPEs for our population. It showed the vulnerability of being the last link in the global supply chain. But the National Reconstruction Fund is about more than helping us uh, produce things at short notice in times of crisis. It's about building a more resilient and more diversified economy with more jobs in regional Australia. Um, at the very heart uh, of the National Reconstruction Fund is an ironclad belief in the capability of Australia know-how. The Albanese government is committed to diversifying our industrial base and the National Reconstruction Fund is the key to unlocking Australia's potential. And I call on all senators in this chamber to support the National Reconstruction Fund. I have Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. Thank you, Senator Farrell. My second question to you today is why is a vibrant Australian manufacturing industry important? 
And what challenges does the Australian industry face? Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator O'Neill again for her, uh, her question. Uh, manu manufacturing uh, does matter because it cr creates uh, sustainable, secure, well-paying jobs. Jobs from uh, coders, welders, uh, designers, researchers, process workers and everything in between. Jobs in regional Australia and our outer suburbs. For too long, the Australian manufacturing industry has been the subject to the threat of political games by the opposition. The NRF will be <coughs> independently run on a commercial basis with decisions taken in the national interests, not marginal seat politics. No colour coded uh, spreadsheets, he spreadsheets here. Uh, again, I call on all senators in the chamber to realise this opportunity to support Australian manufacturing and support the National Reconstruction Fund. Thank you, Minister. Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. Thank you, Senator Farrell, and I appreciate your good wishes for the people of New South Wales on the weekend. What are the international market opportunities that will help our industry grow, and what threats are there to that bright future? Minister Farrell. <coughs> Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and again thank uh, Senator O'Neill <coughs> for her question. Um, we are supporting manufacturing through the NRF, but also by creating new international market opportunities for high-quality Australian products. The Albanese Labor government is opening up new and diversified markets for Australian goods in countries like India. On my recent visit to India with the Prime Minister, we were accompanied by the President of Australian-based hearing, um, hearing device manufacturer Cochlear. Uh, they are working hard to expand their distribution networks in India, so more Indian people have access to this incredible Australian innovation, which creates more jobs both here and at home. For too long, our exports have been concentrated in a single market. Under our trade diversification plan, more Australian-made products uh, will, be will be enjoyed around the world including in India. Thank you, Minister Farrell. The time for answering has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam President. You. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. I refer to the confronting revelations exposed through a recent Four Corners expose on Perth Mint, which unearthed alleged gold doping, money laundering and a complete breakdown of compliance and reporting requirements. I also note Austrac's investigation into the Perth Mint the London Bullion Market Incident Review process that's underway, and revelations around the US state model commodity code coming to light. As important and importantly, comments from the, your Treasurer, who described these revelations as, and I quote, incredibly concerning and very troubling. Noting the West Australian opposition is calling for a Royal Commission, what is the response of the, Royal, of the Albanese government? Uh, thank you, Senator Brockman. Minister Gallagher. The one where there's more gnats than libs. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, and I thank uh, Senator Brockman for the question. Matters relating to the Perth Mint's operations are a matter for the Perth Mint and the Western Australian Government as its owner. Uh, the federal government. Well, hang on a second, Order. Senator Scar. I know you like to answer my questions before I get the opportunity. Hang on. Put your seatbelt on for a second. Um, the federal government takes compliance matters uh, very seriously, and Austrac ordered audit of the Gold Corporation, which trades as the Perth Mint, uh, assessing compliance with anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism finances laws, is due to report in May 2023. They are the responsibilities of the federal government. Um, they are in place. Um, that is the position of uh, the Albanese government. This is largely a matter. Uh, calls for a, a royal commission by the opposition in uh, WA uh, should be matters that the WA parliament deals with and, and the suitable response should be there. But we are satisfied with the work that is uh, underway uh, via Austrac um, doing uh, their assessment, which is due to report to uh, the government or due to release its report uh, in May 2023. Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Senator Brockman, first supplementary. The Perth Mint is a $21.8 billion business trading with customers in more than 130 countries. 
with a conflicted WA Premier refusing to instigate a royal commission through fear of what will be exposed, will the Albanese government take action, engage with Premier McGowan over the need for a royal commission into Gold Corp and Perth Mint to retain the confidence of our trading partners and the Australian public? Thank you, Senator Brockman. Minister Gallagher. Well, I don't agree with the sort of implied insinuations in um, in a Senator Brockman's uh, question. Uh, the uh, the West. Well, it was a pretty long preamble. It was a long preamble there. Um, the Western uh, Australian Premier, uh, Mark, uh, Mr. McGowan, has made it clear uh, that the government is aware of these matters and that there is presently an audit underway and that the Mint is also investing heavily in anti-criminal behaviour and compliance measures. As to whether there is a political dispute or that um, the opposition in WA is running, um, that you are running by proxy through this chamber, Senator Brockman, I think that is largely a matter for the Western Australian Parliament. And If you want to have a say in that, maybe you should stand over there and have a, have a say in the Parliament. They, they, uh, they might need a couple of extra bodies over there, considering but that is why, I mean, the, on the on the matter of substance, that is why there is an Austrac investigation underway due to report Thank in you, May. Minister, it is serious. Has been handled. Senator Brockman, second supplementary. I will remind the minister that the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Act is a Commonwealth Act. Has the government had any conversations with the premier to urge him Order. to take action over this important issue? regarding Order. the reputation of Australia in the international marketplace, and if the Premier won't act, will the Albanese government? Uh, thank you, Senator Brockman. Minister Gallagher. Well, based on the information or the answers I've given you to the previous two questions, both governments are acting. There is an audit underway. There's an assessment underway by Austrac, which is appropriate, and a report to be provided in May. I mean that I don't know how much faster you can be in assessing the concerns that have been raised, the serious concerns uh, that have been raised around the Perth Mint. Um, and Austrax um, have, uh, with their responsibilities um, to assess compliance with anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism -terror financing laws, which is uh, something I did respond to in the first question, that is their responsibility. So the Commonwealth, through its agencies, is responding to the areas that it has responsibility for, and the report will be provided in May, which is two months away. And I think that is pretty swift uh, response. As to conversations between uh, between governments, uh, I have no doubt Thank there have you, been Minister, some. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator uh, Watt. Over the last week, remote communities in my home state um, and of uh, your home state of Queensland have expanded, devastating, have had devastating flooding. Can the minister please advise what the Albanese government is doing uh, to support these communities? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thanks again, Senator Sheldon, for your ongoing work uh, when it comes to disaster recovery. On Friday last week, I travelled to Normanton and Burketown, uh, Gulf of Carpentaria communities, and was able to meet with locals and see the devastating flooding that those communities have experienced firsthand. I want to thank and acknowledge the member for Kennedy, Mr Bob Catter, for his advocacy and for joining me as we toured some of the areas of highest impact. And I also thank Senator Green for her ongoing advocacy for these communities, both to the federal and state government. I also want to thank the mayors of Carpentaria and Berkshires, Jack Bowden and Ernie Camp, as well as other members of the Berkshire Council who gave me a tour of some of the damage in the community. In addition, I'll be meeting Mr Camp and the Mayor of Doomadgee Council, Mr Jason Ned, while they're in Canberra uh, this week. On the same day that I visited these communities, we made the Australian Government Disaster Recovery Payment available to residents in the Queensland local government areas of Bullia, Burke and Mount Isa. This is the one-off payment of $1,000 per eligible adult and $400 per eligible child who have suffered a significant loss as a result of the floods, including a severely damaged or destroyed home or a serious injury. Don't worry, Senator Macdonald, we'll come to you. Uh, we also activated the disaster recovery allowance for the same areas and extended it to the local government areas of Carpentaria, Cloncurry, Doomadgee and Mornington. And this is in recognition of the fact that this event has caused significant disruption to people's livelihoods. 
The Disaster Recovery Allowance provides up to 13 weeks of federal income support to assist people who experience a loss of income as a direct result of a major disaster, such as being by, by being cut off from being able to get to their workplace or from the business that they operate. And there are many such people in our Gulf communities right now. I can inform the House that as of midnight on Monday this week, 1,300 people have received nearly $1 million in, in payments since claims opened just on Friday last week, and that of course followed other support that began within 24 hours of the flood peak. Thank you, Senator Watt. The time for answering has expired. Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for those actions in uh, this very important time. What is the Albanese government doing to ensure that Australians are better prepared for the more intense and more frequent natural disasters we will be Minister. facing due to climate change? Minister Watt. Uh, thanks, Senator Sheldon. Uh, and as we have now demonstrated on numerous occasions in all parts of this country, no matter what state or territory you live in, no matter whether you live in a safe or a marginal seat, and no matter who, you, who represents you in parliament, when a disaster strikes somewhere in Australia, the Albanese government will stand by your side. That's why we always move quickly to offer immediate assistance, whether that be financial or logistical, in, in conjunction with state and territory governments, as well as with the ADF. Uh, we don't pick fights with state governments, and they continue to do that even in opposition. We just get on with the job, cooperating with people, regardless of their political colour, uh, to deliver the support that's needed. And in addition to that immediate help, the Albanese Labor government is also working proactively to fix the failure to prepare that we witnessed over the past decade. And I have noticed Senator Macdonald complaining uh, last night and in the media at the, about the exposure that remote communities have to disasters. What a shame she didn't do a single thing about that in any of the years she was in government. We've got on with the job. We're creating a disaster ready fund and we're keeping communities resilient. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Minister, are there any threats to the Albanese government's work to better prepare Australians for natural disasters? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, Senator Sheldon. Uh, the fact is that for nearly a decade, the coalition failed to make our country more resilient to the impacts of natural disasters, mainly because they didn't believe in climate change. Not only did they not spend a single dollar of their emergency response fund, which was designed to specifically invest in disaster resilience, they also failed to guarantee the ongoing funding of our national, national disaster agencies beyond the July 1 this year. Uh, this is another one of these temporary measures that uh, Senator Gallagher is having to work her way through in the budget, funding that was running out on 30 June this year, and that included the natural disaster management agencies of the federal government. If the coalition had won the election, our national natural disaster agencies would have run out of money on 30 June this year. And as things currently stand, the new national, natural, national emergency management agency requires an injection of new funding simply to continue operating. These are the kind of economic vandals these people were Thank putting you, communities Minister. at risk, and we're going to change it. Has expired. Minister Farrell. After that, uh, terrific, uh, after that terrific answer, uh, President, I ask that further questions uh, be placed on the notice paper. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Oh, Senator Brock. Something with you uh, before you potentially leave the chair, uh, Madam President. Um, there was a matter raised by Senator Thorpe earlier about a senator taking photographs. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask that that is that you address that directly and report back to the chamber? Uh, seek assurance that those photographs have been deleted. Thank it you. has been addressed, Senator Brockman, and um, uh, the senator, Senator Pratt, has been asked to uh, delete the photos from her phone. I was going to speak to Senator Thorpe privately because she's not in the chamber, but I'm happy to also make that information available to the chamber. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Can senators please depart the chamber if that's of their choosing before I give the call? Senator McGrath. Uh, th thank you, Deputy President. I, I rise to, to take note of answers by Senator Farrell to the questions asked by Senator Cadell, um, my good friend for, from New South Wales. And what is interesting is the, the, the gap in reality between 
the government benches and what is happening out in the real world, because there is a massive gap in reality. When you have a Prime Minister who says, Mr Deputy President, it has been a good 10-month period because we've been what we've been doing is going through fulfilling the commitments that we've made at the election. Well, first of all, they've been busy breaking their promises, and secondly of all, they do not understand the cost of living crisis that is impacting upon all Australians, and in particular in particular, my colleague Senator Cadell asked about the price of electricity and what is happening to, to the government's commitment to cut people's power bills. Not by a dollar, not by $1,000, but by $275. Now, before the last election, Prime Minister Albanese and the Labor Party promised 97 times. They promised 97 times that they would cut your power bills. So for the good people who are listening at home, the Labor Party promised to you they would cut your power bills by $275. And they didn't do it once. It wasn't just like a brain burp that you know, sometimes politicians misspeak. It happened 97 times. And what happens is they get into power and it's just like a bit like a Homer Simpson wandering through the staff room and Mr Burns' is sort of you know, a nuclear reactor going, oh, it wasn't, it wasn't me, boss. They just don't know, they've got no idea of how to use the levers of the economy to help the Australian people. Because what is happening under this government is that power prices are actually going up. They're not going to go down by $275, they're actually going to go up by more than that. Thanks, thanks to Labor. Thanks to Labor, who, have, who are very good at talking. And there's some fine wordsmiths on the Labor side. But when you look at the words and you study them, you realise they're very good at making promises, but they're particularly poor. They're particularly poor at delivering on those promises, but they are brilliant. They are gold medal winless medalists at breaking promises. So I'm going to go through some of the promises that, that the Labor government said they would deliver. Now this is going to hurt people because I know most Australians think that, that politicians don't break promises. They think that politicians are honest, altruistic people. And guess what? On this side of the chamber, we are. We are honest, altruistic. We believe in what is good for Australia. But sadly, sadly, Deputy President, on the other side of the chamber, and I, I know you've, you've warned me before about saying rude things, so I won't, and I'm, I'm on best behaviour at the moment, is I, and I'm dis, I disappoint my fans who are listening, um, those who send the nice um, emails and the capital letters, um, is, that, is that the Labor Party are very, very good at breaking promises. So first of all, they said they would cut your power bills by $275. Well, broke. The thing is, they promised that 97 times. Well, guess what? They've broken it 97 times. Uh, they said there'd be cheaper mortgages. Well, guess what? Since Labor have been in power, mortgages keep going up and up and up. So, thanks, Labor. Thanks, Labor, for sending, making my mortgage payments go higher. They said there'd be no changes to super. Well, come in, spinner. We've got another broken promise from Labor. They are now going after your money in your super accounts. So first of all, they're putting up your power bills. Then they're putting up your mortgages. And heaven help you if, you've got a, if, you've got, if you're renting somewhere. First of all, it's so hard to find a place to rent. And secondly, rent is going through the roof because of Labor's policies. But then they're going after your retirement savings. And they promised lower inflation. I mean, this is just so dispiriting, Mr Deputy President, that a, that a modern political party would just make such, such false promises before an election and then, then get into power and skip around this building like fat kids in a lolly shop, stealing all the lollies and then not deliver on their promises because they've forgotten who sent them here. They think the trade union sent them here. They think in this place, you look over there, the good people there, well, most of them, um, is that it's like a retirement home for union barons. This is what it is. Like the UK have got the House of Lords, here we've got the House of Union Barons. And they, they serve two terms as, as the secretary of the paperclip union of, of South Australia, and then suddenly they get elevated to the Senate. So it's almost like their super or their pension policy. It's like, you look, you've done 10 years working for this union, and now your retirement package, um, you know, here we go. Going to, be, going to be a senator for 12 years. Now, the other promise, they said they're not going to touch your franking credits. Well, guess what? They're coming after those because you can never trust a fat kid in a lolly shop like you can never trust the Labor Party when it comes to keeping their promises. Senator Sheldon. 
Besides some offensive comments from the people, those um, the senator before, but I just want to just say that it's a very um, interesting sort of approach to say honest and altruistic. They voted against a $230 average saving to household power bills. That's what they did. That's their honesty. And you know what? They are altruistic because they voted against and did not support a dollar an hour wage increase. That's altruistic. That's altruistic when you're a conservative on that side of the chamber. They turned around and made sure that they voted against multi-employer bargaining, which delivered productivity, which delivered better wages, which produced an opportunity for fair competition amongst companies. They vote against that. They vote against a secure jobs plan because they're altruistic. If that's altruistic, that's what is wrong in this country, and that's why you were voted out. Because they don't understand the importance of making sure that we make a difference in this country on so many fronts, that we build a better country that involves everybody. Now, when we go back to the energy price uh, program from those opposite, they don't have one because they didn't have one for 22, years, 22 occasions. They had no policy. We had been dumped with a no energy policy from those opposite. But we have had them vote against an energy policy that decreases and holds back average uh, prices for power bills. They are the ones that turned around and said that they and hid the fact that there was a 20 per cent increase in the default electricity offer before the election. These are the altruistic. These are the honest. Well, what a load of rubbish. It is disappointing to have those sorts of false allegations made with this parliament, with this Senate. Because the reality is, when you don't vote for, to hold back prices at $230 on average per year, when you turn around and lie about and misrepresent the 20 per cent increase in default electricity offer, and then you go on. In nine years, 22, year, 22 energy policies that didn't float, that didn't fly, that didn't be, wasn't progressed. And yet they have the hide to come in here and say that about honesty and altruisticness. Well, altruistic is about actually that. It's about actually making a difference what the plans are that we've put forward. They ignored, ignored 12 warnings from the ACCC in our email about domestic gas supply. They ignored them. And this is the people that have the hide to come in here and say to the Australian people, we have, not only do they not have an answer, they haven't progressed an answer and they vote against answers because that's the program that they have. And under them, we also saw a four megawatt in dispatchable power leave with only one, meg, uh, one gil, uh, gigawatt uh, coming back in. The Snowy 2.0 uh, is running months late. And of course, we've announced, and quite rightly announced, our energy price relief plan. We've also announced our intent with this May budget to make some incredibly important changes to make sure that there's relief and support for the Australian community that are doing it tough. And doing it tougher because these people that are not altruistic, that are not honest, have turned around and left this country in a hole of over a trillion dollars worth of debt. Whilst they've been running off giving billions of dollars to Qantas without any obligations to the Australian public, tens of millions of dollars to Harvey Norman without any obligations but whilst their profits went up during COVID, put us in a trillion dollars of debt because of their mismanagement, we've been turning around and looking at areas like the Housing Australia Future Fund. They don't want to have 30,000 new social and affordable housing in this country in the next five years. They're voting against it. They said they're opposed to it. They how can you be less altruistic and less honest when you say you are honest? Because the honesty is about the fact they are delivering, uh, in their view and their policies and their suggestions, they're no, no coalition, they're no alition. Their approach to what honesty is is to make sure that every Australian pays the price for their lack of thought, their lack of preparation in the last decade and their lack of capacity to turn around and support good policies that make a difference to the Australian public. And of course those good policies go to the cheaper medicine under Medicare, and a very important initiative, 30 per cent less for prescription medicines on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. That goes to 180,000 free TAFE and vocational education and training places. That's about building our productivity and our capacity up within our community. That's about $50 million TAFE technology fund. All again about improving capacity within the economy and within a productivity. That's smart spending, not wasted spending. That's about making sure we make a difference. So we see these people opposed consistently 
consistently to making sure cost of living pressures are either improved by better opportunities for better wages or, alternatively, by having policies that make a difference to energy prices. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. And, uh, I also rise to speak on the motion to take note of the answer provided by the minister to the question asked by my good friend and colleague, Senator Cadell. And that was a question about the cost of living. And that's an issue that uh, I'm hearing a lot about in my home state of Tasmania. Uh, families are struggling. Co prices are going up, up and up. And they feel like they don't have the means to address those price increases. And it seems like uh, every single day at the moment we are coming into this chamber as uh, the opposition and we are asking questions on behalf of those families in our own states about the cost of living, the skyrocketing cost of living. And every time we ask these questions, and they are important questions that the Australian people want answers to, we find ourselves in a situation where the government brushes those questions off and will try to talk about anything else. If this government was something you bought in a store, uh, Mr Deputy President, well, I think you'd be taking it back to the store and asking for a refund. And then you would take that refund and you'd put that refund towards paying for your power bill, which we know has gone through the roof since this government came to power, or your grocery bill, which we also know has gone through the roof, or your mortgage payment, again, going through the roof. Because the marketing material for this government was very clear. What was written on the box is not the product that the Australians have actually got now. If only I could call the ACCC. They said that if you voted for them, then your cost of living would go down. They said that if you voted for them, then your power bill, each individual's power bill, would go down by $275. They made that commitment 97 times in the lead up to the election last year. They made it over and over and over again. Fast forward 10 months, and not only have they broken that promise, but they are actually asking for credit for bills going up by more than 10 per cent. They want credit for breaking an election promise. Yet they don't want to accept any of the blame for the skyrocketing cost of living that Australians are now facing. Indeed, every time we come into this chamber and we have conversations about the rising cost of living and we ask questions about that $275 commitment that was made 97 times during the election campaign, all we get from the government is avoiding the question at best and talking about the previous government at worst because they don't have anything else that they know how to talk about. They also promised that they wouldn't increase taxes on Australians, and yet they've broken that promise as well. And in the lead up to the next budget in May, it certainly seems, as my colleague Senator McGrath says, that they are laying the groundwork to break that particular promise not to increase taxes on Australians again and again and again. This is a Labor government which said whatever it thought people wanted to hear to get their vote back in May 2022. But in fact, this government does the opposite. Under Labor, the cost of living has gone way up when they said it would go way down. And we know that the Treasurer and the Finance Minister are looking around to see whose pockets they can dip into to plug the holes in the budget coming up in May. Sure, they promised before the election that they wouldn't do any of that, uh, but of course that promise is out the window like the vast majority of the ones that they did make. We saw that when the Treasurer got on national TV and refused to even rule out uh, capital gains taxes on the family home. Admittedly, the Prime Minister did come and clean up that little slip of the tongue by Treasurer Chalmers, but like I say, you can't trust this government when they've broken so many promises already. Who's to say that we won't be having another conversation about capital gains tax come the budget in May? It was pretty obvious uh, when the Treasurer wouldn't even rule out something so obvious that the Labor government are cooking up a long list of possible tax hits on Australians and the Treasurer at that point didn't want to rule anything in or out. But there will be something else. There is always something else when it comes to this Labor government. They promise the world to everyone, quickly run out of money to pay for all of those promises, and when they've run out of money, they will come after yours. 
The Labor promise to cut your power bill by $275 is broken. Their promise to reduce the cost of living is broken. Their promise not to increase taxes on Australians is broken already and looking for even more ways to break it. Senator White. The government understands that the rising cost of living is hurting Australians. The Prime Minister and the Treasurer know that, it's, uh, that it is hitting a lot of Australians hard. The government knows this too, and I know that. Uh, and the Australian people, I think, understand that we didn't create these challenges, but they elected us to take responsibility for addressing them. The, the Albanese government uh, has a three-point plan for addressing the inflation and cost of living challenge in the economy. It's about relief, repair and restraint. Responsible cost, you know, and how that is broken down is it's responsible cost of living relief, which is we and policies like our cheaper childcare policy, cheaper medicines, direct energy bill relief. We're also replying, re repairing the supply side constraints. So we've introduced fee-free TAFE, cleaner and cheaper energy, the National Reconstruction Fund, which hopefully will, will, will go through the parliament, and also we've got a plan for more affordable housing. We've also got responsible budget with spending restrained, as I said, and we want to return almost all the revenue upgrades to the bottom line and, and keep spending essentially flat over the next four years to not add to inflation. So there's a plan. There's a, absolutely a plan. But let's think about how this plan is, has, uh, is, has been has tried to be thwarted by those opposite. Let's talk about the electricity prices. You know, this is, as the question uh, to the minister was about electricity prices, but let's look about this. Look, look closely. It seems to me that those opposite have a bit of amnesia about what they actually did last year. Maybe they can't remember what they did uh, uh, during the Morrison years. They don't remember that uh, the, the they don't want to remember it. Absolutely. And luckily uh, for us, the Australian people saw it and remembered it at the ballot box almost a year ago. They remembered it. But let's, it seems like there's a bit of amnesia and recreation of history. Let's remember last year that the Albanese government legislated to cap wholesale energy prices on coal and gas. We did that in large part because we had to deal with a wasted decade of failed energy policies from the coalition. We did that in part to respond to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which had put enormous pressure on global energy markets. We recalled the parliament, do you remember that, uh, before Christmas to deal with this situation because we prioritised energy prices and we prioritised what we thought uh, was a difficult situation. This government took it very, very seriously. So we legislated the energy price relief plan. Do we remember that? Now, just three months later, we're already hearing from the Australian energy regulator that, it, that had we not acted when we did, energy prices would be 40 to 50 per cent more expensive than they are now. Without the government intervention, Australian uh, families would be paying more for electricity. Without the government intervention, uh, Australian businesses would have paid extra. Um, because we acted, Hundreds of dollars of additional increase have been avoided for households, over a thousand, uh, and thousands of dollars have been saved by people. But wait a minute, let's remember, where was the coalition when this, uh, when this emergency was on? When given the chance to support cheaper power prices, the co co coalition said what? They didn't say yes, they said no. When asked if they would support Australian households and business by stabilising the, the energy market, the Liberal and National Party said, said no. The coalition over there voted against cheaper energy prices and voted against support for Australians feeling the sting of inflation. So if the coalition had been in charge last year, Australians would be paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars more for electricity than they currently are. Why? Because the Albanese government had a plan and we implemented that plan, but with no help from the coalition, no help whatsoever. And are we surprised about that? No, because during their time in office of nine years, they had 20 failed energy policies over that decade. There was inaction, 20, yes, it was 20, a decade of inaction in action that put us in, the, in this mess. They were in charge. They could, they could have had an uh, energy policy, but no, 20 bit the dust. So uh, 
I'm here to remind you of what you did, which was nothing, and what, what the Albanese government have done, which is put it, have a plan, put it into action, and it is delivering for Australians every day of the week. And of that, I am incredibly proud. Senator Bragg. Oh. Well, thank you very much, Deputy President. And the reason that we're having this debate today is because when you are the government for vested interests, you don't have any time to deal with the major challenges that are facing the Australian people. You only have time to work through the narrow set of vested interests that are being set out for you by your great supporters, benefactors and donors. And what we've seen since the election has been a effort to work through the laundry list of grievances from the unions and the super funds and the class action law firms. And of course, we've seen uh, the effort to put in place uh, multi-employer bargaining or patent bargaining. We've seen the efforts to, to line the coffers of the super funds. We've seen the efforts to remove transparency from the workers so they can't see how much money the super funds are sending off to the unions. And of course, we've seen just in uh, recent weeks this hilarious idea of a housing fund where we want the super funds to be given more money so they can buy more houses, but of course the people themselves are banned from buying houses with their own money. So this is the uh, bizarre world of the government for vested interests, where if you're a union or a super fund you get the rolled gold treatment, but if you're a punter you can forget about it. Now, the consequence of the narrow focus here is the government hasn't been able to deal with inflation. Now, we've seen 10 interest rate rises since the election, and for a mortgage holder with a three-quarter of a million dollar mortgage, uh, you're now paying uh, at least one and a half thousand dollars additionally each month. Uh, now, that is a, that, now, that has been massively fuelled by Canberra. Uh, the government is, is fuelling inflation. Uh, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has warned that the use of off-balance sheet items has fuelled inflation and is a risk to our budget and our economy. Now, inflation is at a 33-year high. Canberra and the Labor Party is massively fuelling inflation because Canberra and the Labor Party are addicted to massive spending projects uh, off-balance sheet but also through the budget itself. So you've seen $45 billion in off-balance sheet items, the reconstruction slash fund for unions, the housing fund, the rewiring fund, but you've also got uh, uh, tens of billions of dollars in new expenditure locked into the budget with the bills that have passed the parliament since the election. So you've got a government that is heavily invested in enriching its favourite vested interests through policy proposals, but you've also got a government that is committed to fuelling inflation, perhaps not deliberately, but because it can't seem to restrain expenditure. And it's prepared to ignore the IMF and the independent observers here, and it continues to bring bills before the parliament. I mean, there are now bills before the parliament to establish the union slash fund, the reconstruction fund, uh, and the housing fund, and we've just con considered the housing fund uh, at the Economics Committee this week and will be reporting later today or tomorrow. Uh, this is another $10 billion, uh, and again, going against the warnings of the IMF, the government has decided that it will fuel inflation. And then, of course, we hear the Labor Party people come into the Senate and read out their pieces of paper and read the talking points about how bad the Morrison government was and the other governments. And sure, there were, there were many bad things in the past, but the reality is that the pandemic was managed as well as it could have been from an economic viewpoint. Now, the Labor opposition wanted to pay people to get vaccinations. The Labor opposition wanted to pay JobKeeper to foreigners and wanted to pay JobKeeper to universities. And uh, we, will net, we won't forget that because Effectively, because effectively, effectively, the idea of paying JobKeeper to extending it and then paying it to foreigners 
uh, was a ridiculous proposition at the time and it was ruled uh, out of order. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Labor would say, oh, you know, you, you switched off too, too quickly. Uh, but, uh, you know, Dr Lee or Mr Lee or Minister Lee, as he now is, has gone through and done a forensic examination of all this sort of stuff and we'll come back to this in the next episode. Thanks very much. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, sorry, I'll just put the question. Those the questions say aye, against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer from the Honourable Don Farrell to the question asked by my colleague, uh, Senator Larissa Waters, in relation to the IPCC report. This week, Australia and the world received its last warning from the IPCC about the, about the dangerous pathway that we're on, the climate danger we're on with current settings uh, if we don't keep coal and gas in the ground. But of course it wasn't just the IPCC that blew the whistle on the Labor government's flawed policies for dealing with climate. Because we've seen some 54 climate organisations and environment organisations deliver an open letter to the, to the Albanese government this week calling on them to prevent any further new coal and gas developments in Australia, and that's what the IPCC has said is absolutely needed. And those organisations in the open letter included 350 Australia, Friends of the Earth Australia, GetUp, Greenpeace, Original Power, Oxfam Australia, the Wilderness Society, Environmental Justice Australia, Comms Declare, Common Grace, Move Beyond Coal, Co-Power, Kaha, Lock the Gate, Environment Victoria, Conservation South Australia, Conservation Council South Australia, the Queensland Conservation Council, the Environment Centre NT, the Australia Institute, the Edmund Rice Centre, uh, the uh, um, WA Climate Leaders, the Pacific Islands Council of Queensland, the Environment Council of Central Queensland, even the Labor Environment Action Network in the Northern Territory, Environs Kimberley, uh, Wodonga Albury Watch towards Climate Health, Climate Action Newcastle, Darabin Climate Action, Zero Emissions Noosa, Environment Victoria Southeastern Volunteers, Surfers for Climate, listen to the surfers, Australian Marine Conservation Society, Paracan, Climate Action Canberra, um, Cairns and Far North Environment Centre, Circa, uh, the Green Institute, the Australian Rainforest Conservation Society, Climate Justice Union, C4CE, the Bayside Climate Crisis Action Group, Shirecan, People Climate Assembly, Climate Emergency Action, Glenera Climate uh, Action, uh, Glenera Emergency Climate Action Network, Community Power Agency, Climate Emergency Australia, Lighter Footprints, Psychology for a Safe Australia, ARC, the Australian Parents for Climate Action, Green Music Australia, Sedemia, Vote Earth Now. 54 organisations signed the letter demanding climate action, demanding that the Albanese government change its policies and keep coal and gas in the ground. Will the Albanese government listen? Senator Thorpe, you're, on a different, you're going to take note of a different, your own question? Okay, so I'll put the question. Those of the questions say aye against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Thorpe, you're seeking to take note of. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of Minister Gallagher's uh, answers in relation to Beetaloo. You have the call. Thank you. Um, the Beetaloo is apparently responsible. Uh, the responsibility of Beetaloo comes under the Territory. Um, so we want to know: Will you rule out giving Commonwealth funds for Middle Arm? Uh, there's no accountability and transparency in um, fracking or any kind of uh, destructive behaviour to our Mother Earth. There is no free prior and informed consent. Labor does talk about consultation over consultation over consultation. We've also uh, heard from a Labor minister that consultation does not mean consent. Uh, it may be something that Labor need to learn a little bit more about. Uh, you can't just rock up and talk to people and, and think that that is consenting to a project. Uh, the unconscionable conduct, not only from the coalition when they are in power, but now the Labor government are still acting unconscionably by uh, only dealing with land councils who don't always represent traditional owners. Uh, traditional owners are being um, bullied, they're being locked out of meetings, they don't get to, to even have a say about any destructive uh, behaviours on their country. It goes through a peak body that is funded by the Commonwealth Government. 
uh, and we see how that turns. You know, the, the last NLC um, CEO is now a uh, Labor uh, member in the other place. Uh, and so whoever allows for this consent to happen uh, so that these mining companies can destroy our lands and waters, it seems that uh, their reward is a seat uh, as a politician for the Labor government. Put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it.